for this panel, um, how crucial are derivatives to growing, if you like, the international role um, of exchanges? And, and we all know that there is a mood now where exchanges are looking increasingly to um, try and have a derivatives arm attached to them in some one sense or another. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a few questions to our panellists and see how they, how they tackle them and how they answer them. And I think the, the, the first one is, in terms of derivatives, presumably we're, we're not talking about any derivative product. We're talking about where there must be some international demand or we have to educate demand for domestic product. So I don't know, don't even like to tackle this one. How do you think you should be moving internationally into this space and growing the volume? I can look at you first. <laughs> uh, well, first is a back does this work? Yeah. Okay. First, as a background, uh, my exchange only trades derivatives. We only allowed to trade derivatives. Uh, Indian regulators have split the market over many different regulators. Every regulator wants to have its own exchange. Uh, so we have actually we created a subsidiary right. as a uh, stock exchange. Um, and then we were told that we had to reduce our equity to 5%. So, um, but uh, the group uh, of which my exchange is part uh, runs many different types of exchanges, including uh, electricity, spot forward exchange, uh, different spot futures markets, Islamic futures markets, so a whole range of products. Um, I, I would, I mean, t two points. A, um, I don't believe in a sequential model. I, I don't believe that you uh, first have to develop a spot market, then a forward market, then a futures market. Uh, I think that in uh, the current environment, uh, the spot and futures components can actually uh, be mutually reinforcing. Uh, you need some minimum conditions in the spot market before you can develop a derivatives market. But uh, do that move to the derivatives market as soon as possible, because that will in turn reinforce the, the functioning of the spot market, uh, improve quality standards, in, in also offer more opportunities to market participants to use an organized market rather than stay in, in bilateral trading. Uh, second point, uh, derivatives is the sweet part of the business. Um, the PE multiples of derivatives markets are a lot better than those of pure stock uh, markets. Uh, the uh, threat of competition is much less. Uh, so for good corporate reasons, I think uh, you're well off uh, mm. looking at uh, derivatives. Okay. Christian, how are you growing the space, the international space? What do you see as the prime targets for your market? So um, in Romania, the derivatives market, so the exchange that I am uh, manage now, the Cybex, it's uh, very peculiar and uh, also very strange. We have only 5% local products, but we are trading in huge volumes foreign products. We are the only exchange in Europe trading the futures on the Dow Jones. And we made more than millions of contracts per month after we started one and a half year ago. Then. The problem, I suppose, is that um, in Romania, in all the eastern countries, all the process of privatization was made with lack of transparency and with lack of credibility. So probably the key of success of Eastern Europe, it was uh, the words of Churchill, so uh, they were go from from failure to failure with uh, without losing enthusiasm, mm -hmm. and uh, in all this process, uh, investors are not very happy with. And uh, Dow Jones, by the way, it was something very credible. Mm. It was a market that you cannot manipulate. It was an index that you cannot manipulate and that nobody in the world can do it. That was the idea of the investors. And this was the reason that we built a success product. We are trading the Dow Jones futures denominated in local currency. Mm. It's 
Another strange thing, we launch it in dollars and in Romanian currency, but we have very few contracts in dollars and huge volumes in local currency. So derivatives are benefits for the market, are benefits not only when are very well regulated, because you know we tried from 2008 until now to re-regulate the markets, but I don't think we can do this with the same people that they deregulated in the 90s. Mm. Because if we think that uh, changing the chairs on the board of Titanic will not be successful because the Titanic will think also. Okay. So my idea is that we have to join some forces to transfer credibility for one exchange to the others. It's much more important that uh, we can transfer credibilities than products. So I made a joint with the uh, depository and with Varsho exchange, stock exchange, for the simple reason that they are very credible. In Eastern Europe, they are the best, they are very credible, and I can bring a part of this credibility in Romania. Mm. So the same thing it was with, um, with, um, with the Dow Jones, and now we are trading gold, we are trading futures on currencies, but not on the pairs of Romanian currency that we are making huge volumes. The other very important thing, I suppose, is that uh, the moment that you bring a very credible product for a very credible exchange, you can increase the credibility even of the local products. So, actually, the Romanian government put us in charge to build the gas market. And Romania is the only European Union member who is producing gas, and they discover now hundreds of billions of cube meters in the, in the Black Sea. So we are producing, and we will even export gas. Interesting. Perhaps I can just turn to Kassar, because I, I find that quite interesting. In other words, um, actually, importing. Sorry, I've got a mic. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm all right. I'm like you chaps. That's um, the reason that he's like, <laughs> then we are. It's, dom it's called dominance. Um, I, I thought that was quite interesting because there's a case where you've actually imported what is essentially a foreign product. Okay, it's international, but you've imported it onto your exchange almost, and, and in that way, enhancing domestic demand. So you're actually increasing the interest of your domestic users. I mean, is that. How, how would you approach this whole question of internationalizing your marketplace? For, for us, uh, the Thailand Future Exchange is uh, like six years old exchange, and actually, it's um, what it's what established by the Stock Exchange of Thailand, which is a uh, dominant uh, stock exchange in Thailand. So, actually, the Stock Exchange is diversifying their revenue uh, to be like on the on the uh, derivative size. And so far, that uh, we we are quite different from Romania. Because uh, actually we are grow from in size. Uh -huh. Every products are domestic uh, bonds, and uh, we just uh, recently that have uh, the commodities on the go, uh -huh, go futures, which is uh, quite good in terms of uh, all the Asian among the Asian exchange. Mm -hmm. But to respond to your uh, question, that is uh, because of uh, Thai market is uh, basically our domestic uh, are quite invest in in Thailand because of uh, the capital control from the central bank. So uh, the domestic people to go, uh, to go offshore investment is quite difficult. But uh, if it's a uh, foreign participants, we are very welcome. So uh, we don't have any uh, special rule or special uh, requirement for the foreign participation. That's why uh, all the Thai people are used to invest only in, in what in all the domestic uh, uh, asset class, but recently that uh, the central banks uh, has faced with the uh, strong, the strengthening, the strengthening of uh, the Thai baht, which is a local currency. So they are uh, changing the policy to push the people to invest offshore, 
this is, I think this is trade tender exchange. So what we have been doing uh -huh, in both uh, the stock exchange and the future exchange is uh -huh, we are going to, going to import uh, some of uh, the, the foreign uh, the foreign asset like the ETFs that uh, we, are, we are going to have the Hang Seng ETF. Uh, that is, uh, I think this year we are going to have the Hang Seng ETF. Last two years we have the China ETF. This is to, like, to feed the appetite of the Thai people that like to invest outside Thailand. And the reason that uh, we haven't done the derivative is because of, uh, I think, on the education size, that uh, is the same as uh, the German, uh, because uh, we have been doing a lot of education to educate people. And I think for the index future that import from other country, it would happen in, in possibly next year. You, yeah, do. I mean, education, presumably, is a pretty important part of all of this. Well, not, 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 not really when not it comes really. to, this, to this, to, not in this particular area, uh, because the demand is there. Um, uh, one, one of the things my group is doing is setting up a big uh, exchange, a Pan-African exchange. In the original roadshows, uh, we went around basically talking about African products. Uh, until in, uh, I think there's a second uh, meeting, uh, someone sets, sets up in the floor and says, look, I'm, I'm managing a, a big Kenyan uh, pension fund. Uh, what I'm interested in, I want to be able to take exposure to Chinese risk, to, to Latin American risk. Offer me those products. So, um, and, and I can give other examples from Latin America, from, from Indonesia. Um, uh, investors are global. Now, regulators, they're global in their mindset, but the regulators don't allow them to be global, and KYC norms make it very difficult for them to even become global if they want to. It's simply too expensive to open an account nowadays, if it's a London or, or US uh, broker. Um, so that is what exchanges can do. They can write derivatives, giving those people access to the markets that they're interested in, in their local country, with a local broker, uh, cleared in local currency. You don't need a lot of education for that because nowadays a very large part of the investment audience is sophisticated enough for that. Now, uh, education becomes important when you develop primary markets uh, mm. on the back of those primary markets. Yeah. But when it comes to what I would call gateway contracts, the appetite is, is there. Uh, you need to provide the product, that's all. Sounds encouraging. Now, let, let me just pause, let me go to the audience. We've, said a, we've talked a little bit about you know, what is important in international is the mar market base, and you right, rightly raised, well, actually, will the regulators allow you to do that? Because, actually, there are growing constraints in ac accessing overseas institutional and corporate customers. There are problems sometimes about getting um, exchanges actually into other jurisdictions. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on this question about internationalizing what is essentially a domestic market, and I don't mean to insult any of my panelists by saying that, but that's where they start. Everyone starts with that one. Um, any views? Anyone want to comment? Yes. Yeah, I think there has to be some sort of framework that allows people to do that. Because if, uh, if for example, regulators, regulators try to stop this, uh, people are not going to stop anyway. I mean, they're going to you know, trade through uh, you know, other routes that uh, you know, regulators don't see and go to the black market or hidden shops and you know, mm. things like that. So um, in order to uh, mitigate risk, it's important that uh, countries see that this is going to happen and have some sort of collaboration at the level of the regulators uh, that this be allowed. I think that's right. And I think more people diversify their investments in order to be more spread and reduce their risk, the more they're going to be looking at foreign products. And to the extent they do that, they're going to be looking at foreign derivatives to manage the risk of those products. I mean, do, do you see that process of diversification as actually bringing in more demand for your product? Or well, right, right now, uh, on, on my own exchange, MCX, regulators don't, don't permit it. But, but what we see in the, the international group ventures, uh, definitely it, it's there. Um, and I think a lot of the localization of, of trade uh, is actually driven by regulations. Mm. Uh, and I, I, 
I know that there's a that at least seems to be recognized in the discussions in, for example, the U.S. But whether that will reflect in actions, I I have my doubts. I mean, with what is happening there, uh, a big chunk of trade could actually be driven overseas uh, into places that are more investor friendly, uh, like Singapore or, for that matter, Mauritius. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is that uh, these markets will exist, but they will exist where regulators permit them to, to exist. And it, nowadays, uh, you can trade with, with you know, milliseconds delays uh, from the exchange into an exchange in, in, from the US into an exchange in, in Singapore or even Mauritius. There, there are cables everywhere. Um, so as an exchange, you're actually quite footloose. Um, and regulatory arbitrage, I think, will be the uh, the name of the game in uh, in the foreseeable yeah. future. Let, let, let me ask this: quick. I mean, one way through is is linkages. I mean, they've had a bit of a mixed history. Some of them have worked very well. Some of them haven't worked quite so well. It's one way, though, for an exchange to access, if you like, a foreign client base is actually to engage in a, in a linkage of some sort. Can I ask you? I'll perhaps talk to you two there next with that one. Do you see but an advantage? In that? First. What I want, because we are speaking here that it's very good to, uh, to ver diversify portfolios and to have uh, a lot of products, of different products, uh, links between them and so on. So you know in the derivatives market, as much you diversify, you will increase the risk enormously. It's much more difficult to control a risk when you have a butterfly spread, spread calendar than a simple call on the right. Mm -hmm. So, and I want to tell you something because um, before to be president of this exchange, I was for more than 16 years a big speculator on the derivatives, and before, like formation, I'm a PhD in mathematics. So, <laughs> the subprime market, the subprime market right. was created yeah. by five very smart guys, French ones, from Ecole Polytechnique de Paris. So, uh, they realized that diversifying the products the credit, the mortgage, and so on, creating the salami with good meat and bad meat, mixing and remixing, and you know perfectly the story. You will create a product that will be very easy to sell. And in the end, we know, we are living. We are living now what's happened at the end of this uh, story. The same problem is uh, with the CDS. Imagine, so now we are able to insure a bond or a T-bond of a European state, it's okay. But we are able to insure twice. So I can buy a CDS, not for a bond that I already bought before, but I can buy even two, even three CDS. That means that I am able to insure your house without owning your house. Mm. So my interest that your house will burn and I will take the money, but you will suffer. So all these problems we are problems that the regulators are not very interested mm. in solving. And I suppose that um, the future of the industry is now in a big danger, in a huge and big danger. Because at one moment, I will tell you something in Romania. So Romania was until 2008 with 90% of the market local products. When the underwriting values, who was the most important uh, stocks in Romania, was down 90%, 90%, the sport market, in uh, 2008, the futures market, the single uh, stocks futures market on these stocks disappeared. Mm. 
So we must be very careful because we can, with the idea that we have to increase, to bring new products, to increase volumes, to increase costs. You asked before that, uh, or somebody asked before that, okay, if we will increase uh, the volumes, the costs are growing also, the profit will be very small. Yes, we will arrive at an inflation of two digit. So that's okay. the huge problem. We must be very careful not to grow so quick that we will burn in a couple of months. Okay, so Kasari, no short-termism then in growth. Long-term growth is good. For us, I think for the international products, uh, how we work in the board, board, uh, board option, the first option that we mentioned that we just uh, got the license and uh, do it in, in, in uh, domestic style that uh, in the local currency, that one, uh, I think uh, it would be like, because uh, when we evaluating that, uh, should we go uh, to have some kind of linkage with other exchanges? Uh, but uh, we found out that uh, it has uh, more difficulties in our regulation regarding all the uh, capital controls. So I believe that uh, for at this, um, at this stage, uh, we are going to kind of uh, to import uh, those uh, products into and our countries. But that one would be on the index size. But another is uh, like commodity size that we see that uh, on the, the, the metals uh, futures. Uh, what we have to evaluate is that that is more than uh, other thing is liquidity because of our country is quite small. We have like uh, about uh, 60,000 account that trade on the derivative size. So, uh, and uh, for the metal side, I think we need much more than that. So when we look into the cooperation with others, uh, uh, majors, uh, exchange suited the, 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 the metal derivatives, we are, we are quite on the size of uh, we like to have some kind of linkage. And uh, we might possibly select some of uh, the products mm -hmm. to do the linkage. Let, let, let me come to another way of growing your space, which is mergers. Mm -hmm. If we go beyond the linkages and get into the merger argument, because um, we, we've had a, a really interesting, I think, difference in view between the US when it came to CME and CBOT. I think I'm open to correction from Fred, who's sitting over there in the corner, but it, it looked a little bit like we want an international champion. So actually, we're going to abandon regional competitiveness in favor of international competitiveness. So we want someone with very big pockets, um, very big size, who can go out and compete internationally. Now, there's an issue here because we know what happened with what the European view was of this, that actually, no, we're not going to sacrifice, as, as they saw it, regional competitiveness in order to become internationally competitive. So I think there's a difference in view, and I, I'm going to turn to you and just ask you for a view on this, because mergers are still very much on the cards, as we've seen. There are a number of issues around there at the moment. Yeah, it's not just Europe, but also Canada, uh, Australia. Uh, and I actually think that that's a completely outdated uh, view. Markets are global. Mm. Um, the idea that uh, you somehow can isolate the market, uh, for that matter, in India, which has much tighter controls than Europe has, uh, you, you can't do that anymore. Mm. Uh, uh, you, you compete uh, globally, um, pools of money uh, float around. Uh, if you uh, are thinking uh, locally or just in, in about your own sub-region, uh, you're not creating a globally strong exchange and sooner or later uh, uh, your exchange will become uh, marginalized. So um, yeah, markets are overly global. Um, now, mergers, uh, linkages are often constrained by regulatory uh, problems. Mm. Uh, a merger, you've got one regulatory problem and after that it would be easier. <laughs> so, uh, they, have, they have different type of, of obstacles. Uh, I, I do believe that mergers will continue happening. Uh, I'm surprised that the nationalism of uh, in different countries has been so strong as we've seen over the past uh, two years. But I, I do believe that the economic rationale for them is very large. Uh, and uh, they will happen across the uh, the space, not, not just derivatives, derivatives, or derivatives uh, stocks. Mm. 
Uh, I actually think that uh, there's a much larger space of financial markets out there. Um, constraint will be uh, regulations only. And yet we're going to see a proliferation amongst the smaller alternative execution venues. So we're going to get a sort of curious situation perhaps where you're going to see the bigger exchanges looking to merge to go global and then you're going to have this smaller group of new CEFs and all sorts of other things and OTFs beginning to emerge with smaller specialist low-cost markets. So it's, it's going to be an interesting contrast. It's not only cause, well, about mergers because uh, it's a problem that uh, a lot of investors trading derivatives are not very well educated. Not at all. They didn't know anything about risk. Mm. They didn't know anything about Cross, Ross, Rubinstein formula, neither about Black and Scholes. Believe me. So they understand something like the Forex market and they understand that some, they can make money in two seconds. So uh, the only way that they are trading is the common sense. Now, if you are trading derivatives who are difficult products with the common sense, when you merge different exchanges, you have, you need the same common sense. And probably the same common sense in Romania is not the same common sense in India, I'm sure. Could be the same. We lost it, sorry, we lost okay. the It's okay. It could be the same. Um, I don't know, the same between Turkey and India, or uh, our common sense would be the same like all the other Eastern uh, European country, but will never be the same like French common sense. So it's very important in this merger to find people and mentality similar. Because if not only to reducing cost and increase and increase in doing big things, um, if you look even in the huge mergers in, uh, in IT, so the big mergers in IT didn't bring spectacular results after. You are increasing, increasing, and then it's saturation. So now every, I, I saw yesterday evening, everybody was asking who Apple will buy, because Apple now has hundreds of billions, 100 billions cash, so they will buy something. Why? Why? Why have Apple to buy somebody? Probably Apple is so big, or the famous too big to fall, that he have to split off, not to buy something. Okay. And the same are the exchanges. But the problem is that we are unable to collaborate. We are unable, we don't have any product, Romania with India, or we are collabor our collaboration is only nearby our country, and uh, nothing else. So we have a collaboration, a huge one with Chicago Mercantile Exchange, of course, because we brought a lot of products from there, including the Dow Jones. But instead of thinking about merger, I suppose that we have to start to collaborate. And we don't collaborate. In the derivatives markets, it's a lack, huge lack of collaboration. Interesting. I, I think for the Asian country, they have, right, I think at Ratan said that uh, we, we think all the government, all the greater things that uh, exchange is a uh, uh, national treasure. So the merger would be a kind of a, a, a remote. And uh, if I, I look into my, my country exchanges, both the stock market and the derivative size, uh, most of the activities are coming from the domestic. Like derivative is 90% a domestic play, and uh, stock exchange would be like uh, 60%. So I, I think all the activity has been in the domestic size. If we, are, we like to merge into other exchanges, so we have to think that what we should get or they, what they should get from us. Because I think both parties have to think about the business model. Mm -hmm. That's why, uh, and for the small exchange like us, uh -huh, uh, it's not merging, it would be acquisition. So, and uh, we don't need money. And we don't need money. we have enough money. And uh, I think uh, uh, our activities are based in the domestic. But uh -huh, 
we we still aware of the uh, 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 we still aware of uh, being a small exchange and uh, being like uh, uh, minimization from other people. So what we has been doing among the Asian exchange is uh, they have the cooperation called the Asian <coughs> Engage. And uh, it will start with the stock market that uh -huh, they have a kind of uh, the uh, platform for the routing the orders among the ASEAN uh, communities. Uh -huh. they, they will start uh, with the three exchanges uh, in this year, and hopefully that uh -huh, it would expand into 10 of uh, the ASEAN. This would, uh, what, what this project expect is like to put the ASEAN asset into the, uh, the world mapping. So people, when they look into the ASEAN, it might not look at the individual countries. So if we can show it, uh, they have like, uh, at, le like at least six exchanges uh, in the ASEAN. That, that would, would give the ASEAN its more powers and more bargaining powers. But that would start from the stock market. But for the derivative size, I think among the ASEAN uh, exchange, only uh, Singapore is the biggest one, but others are quite small. I think that, I'm going to come to the audience again in a minute, but I think um, that's really interesting because the sort of the idea of having an ASEAN financial services market, a single financial services market. You don't need a single currency, by the way. No, <laughs> I think that. we all recognize that. Um, but, but in that context, this has been on the cards. This has been an objective for a long time. Are you saying now that this is going to happen? Because when we talk about international growth, we mustn't lose the sight of regional growth and actually dropping barriers within a given region, as we've seen in the EU. The States obviously is far more advanced in that context. Are we really on the road now for this happening in ASEAN countries? I think it, this one, uh, for, for, for routing the orders, I think it, by technology-wise, it doesn't matter because everyone can access to each country. But I think this is a, a kind of a, a signal that uh -huh, the regulators among the ASEAN have a committee to refine some of their rule and regulation to be in line uh -huh, together. And possibly the cross-borders uh, transaction would be easier. Uh, including the tax treatment. That would be a, a good starting point among the ASEAN. Right. I'm going to come back to our delegates now and just ask if you've got any questions. So we've talked a little bit about mergers, we've talked a little bit about linkages. Does anyone have any views on that? Yes, one there. Hello. Uh, I am from Argentina and our country, as, as well as many others, has imposed quite tight controls on capital flows. So my question is for Christian Sima, and it's divided into three parts, uh, because I'm interested in, in the volume you mentioned of uh, international products, not domestic products. Uh, who are the main participants of the Doshan futures, and did, uh, do that participants are regulated and forced to remain trading in Romania? And the last part is, which are the mechanisms you put in place to bring liquidity from CME or other exchanges to Cybex? Okay, that's good question. So the best thing is that I will tell you the whole story. So uh, I went to Chicago for this purpose two years ago and I asked them, okay, we wanted to list the Dow Jones futures in Romania. They look at me and said, okay, what do you think about? Well, and not in Bucharest, the exchange is in the middle of the county. It's a famous uh, town of Transylvania, very nice, uh, but very famous for paintings and museums, not for finance. And they said, do you think that you will be successful? I think so. Okay. It was a very bad mood. It was uh, the end of 2009, so uh, a nice moment to discuss with Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Probably now I will still wait uh, in front of the door, but at that moment it was, uh, they was very, very, very polite. They are still very polite. <laughs> it was only a joke. <laughs> and they allowed me to trade the futures on the Dow Jones 45 minutes from <laughs> Uh, 16.30 Romanian time, that means 8.30 Chicago time. 
and uh, until uh, a quarter after five. Okay, I said, but in 45 minutes, who will open the position? I know that the most important volume is at the opening of Chicago, the most important on it's even one hour before when you publish the dat data and so on. And they said, okay, but uh, you need to make 5,000 contracts in one month. Of course we made it. We made it uh, three, four brokers between them because uh, it was impossible that some normal investor enter in, uh, in such a market. And then they allowed us from 4.30 in the afternoon until uh, 7 p.m. And we made uh, 50,000 contracts. And then they allowed us from 9 o'clock until uh, in the morning until 7 p.m. And now we are trading uh, from 9 o'clock a.m. to 11.30 p.m. So all day long and probably we will include even, uh, even during the night. Then the first and the most important thing was that I started this product with the market maker from the beginning. Second, it was very good because instead of trading, I told you that the Dow Jones in Romania is denominated in local cars in Lake. Now, instead of creating the hedge of the exchange rate, who is normal, the software that we are offering to the market maker is creating exactly the rate between the currency and the volume of the contracts. That means when the market maker is buying, supposing it's three, dollar, three lei for one dollar, Supposing, it's like this. So for each uh, 10 contracts that somebody is buying in uh, Chicago, he needs 30 contracts in Romania. So the computer is closing on the other part, exactly the difference. Of course, all the time there are some uncovered contracts, but they are so small that it's not a risk for a big market maker. The market maker, um, brings liquidity at the beginning and uh, for Romanians first it was the Romanian gamblers you know that they was very very happy to play in local currency without changing in dollars making another deposit and then changing in local currency it was perfect I will give you something else we have now a product who is going very very well in the last three months from the launch so euro dollar cross rates but instead of, uh, so you are buying 1 million euros against dollar, but you are not uh, earning or losing dollars like normal. So one pips is one Romanian currency. So you are buying euro dollars, futures, and you are losing or making uh, Romanian currency. It's going very, very well. We, are, we have, after three months, even 20,000 contracts per day. So, uh, this idea with putting everything in local currency, it was very successful. Now we will try to do with, with the DAX index from Euronex. Or if uh, as Malaysia has a lot of money, we have a lot of idea, but less money than you have, we can, we <laughs> can arrange uh, to bring some products even to, <laughs> to Asia. And the market maker was very, very, very well structured. And um, he created liquidity. But not only this, if you are looking now, you have the same spread like in Chicago. So in Romania, you have the same spread. If you have half a point from the Dow Jones in Chicago, you will have half a point in Romania. The same thing. The only difference is that it's local currency. And of course, the advertising was, we spent less than 20,000 to make our advertising because everybody knows about Dow Jones. It was very credible. And it was, uh, so all the advertising was like this. After a lot of 20 years that they cheat you with a lot of products who, who arrive in bankruptcy and so on, look, you have a product that is living from the last more than 
150 years. Okay, I think we have to move, move on now. Anyone want to add to that, or should we move on to other things? No? Okay, there's a question there. It was the Warsaw Commodity Cleaning House. Just a two short question to Christian. First, who is the market makers? And second, they are profitable or not? Of course, I'm talking about the Don Jones contract. Very profitable. <laughs> and I will explain you why. So, uh, the market maker is WBS, who is a local market maker, who has my company for more than 18 years. Now there are different brokerage firms. It's very profitable, this operation of the market making, because it's based on the statistics that the small investors on derivatives are 95% losing money in the short period of time. So the market maker is not closing immediately the products. So he's waiting until the difference is 100 or 200 contracts, and then he is closing the, the position. And that's happened until probably one day Goldman Sachs will arrive to sell 20,000 contracts in one order, and uh, it will be less profitable for the local market maker. But who knows? I. I have a huge experience, so even with Salomon Brothers, so I know not all the time the big whale can eat the small fish. Okay. Most times, <laughs> maybe. Most times <laughs> happen. That, that's always been a fear. And for the digestion, some small fish are very, very difficult to be. Okay, we've got a question over there. Yeah, sorry. So 95% uh, of the small investors are losing their money at the end of the day. If you want the exactly statistics, because yes. I'm a mathematician, yes. I can tell you that uh, people who are trading less than uh, 500 contracts in one order are losing 99.5%. It was certified in the last two years. I made on different markets different. Right. If you are speaking about futures, futures, options, everything you want. Uh, so what about the big investors, the company that they the know The big how investors, have. the pension funds who are making strategies, who are well educating, who are taking less risk, are, but when I, uh, you have to understand something that when I'm telling you that 99.5% are losing money, that doesn't mean that if you have 100 investor participants of the market, all they will lose the money. No, the difference between people who are making money and people who are losing money, at the end, 99% are losing. So if, you, if the market maker will buy all the contracts and will sell all the contracts, it's not happened like this, because even if, if it, the spread is very small, he will buy the contracts, supposing 100 contracts, but the next day somebody else will buy. So the market maker is a, has a closed position. It's finished his position, because he, he already sold. And the position was transferred between the two other participants. So, well, you me, understand? Let me so it's sure. not 99%, sure. so it's 100 people. Because if not in three months, everybody will be bankruptcy. And yes. I will close. Yes, I mean, I mean uh, I'm thinking about it from the risk point of view. You the know, difference you, uh, between the have, money so the difference between the money that they are losing and the money that they are making, it's going to the market maker 99.5% for small volumes. For small volumes. For small yes. volumes. Yes. The other volumes, the market maker, who has a very good algorithm, I don't know if it's so good until the end, but in the last two years it was good. So the, the, last, the market maker is closing the huge volumes immediately, instantly. Okay. It's Christian, the machine I, think I have to bring in another two panelists here very quickly to make 
their comments about small size, small size investors lose vast amounts of money, probably, probably because they're trading on price, they're not hedging, they're just purely speculating. But Lau, do you have a view on that? Well, we, we only have small users. Uh, Indian law doesn't permit uh, institutions to trade uh, commodity derivatives, right. uh, not even managed funds. So it's, uh, uh, we have commercials uh, and uh, retail uh, investors. Uh, no, in our case, uh, it's not true that 95% uh, loses money. Uh, by the way, on these statistics, uh, keep in mind that all investors know that you have to cut your losses, let your profits uh, run. Mm. So even successful investors uh, are more often wrong than right. But when they're wrong, they cut their losses. When they're right, they let their profits run. So even if you're more often mm. wrong than right, you can still be profitable. Um, in, in our markets, we, we do have a lot of, uh, of really small uh, commercials. Uh, our biggest contract is uh, gold. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of jewelry companies in India that, that are using our gold contract for hedging. Um, and they're basically passing on uh, whatever price they have to, to, to the consumers. So, sure. um, on, on the uh, investment uh, side, uh, we have a very young market, eight, eight years. And we have seen the number of clients uh, increasing year in, year out, quite rapidly. Uh, our brokers had 800,000 uh, clients at uh, the end of 2009. Uh, now uh, they have more than 2 million. Uh, we also know that the clients who come in continue trading. We have very relatively little uh, percentage of people who come in and then go out, which mm. presumably would be the case if they were losing money. Okay. Uh, so no, I, I don't think that these are such bad markets. Of course, we, all, we don't have market makers officially, so uh, <laughs> they're not there to take money out of the market. Okay, okay. For, us, uh, for us, For us, I think uh -huh, on the retail side, uh -huh, they are very good at, uh, if it's a commodity side go, they are very good at vending. Gold price uh, keep increasing like last year, but uh, we found out that after the August and September that the gold price keep dropping and very volatile. Uh -huh. The retail size, uh, I think they are not good at it. They they losing a lot of money. Uh -huh. So so far that uh -huh, we see that uh -huh, the uh, number of the gold uh, futures trading traders has been declining, but uh, they come back uh, recently. Uh, but uh, on the index size, uh, if it's for the index uh, products, uh -huh, most of them are very good at on the when when the market down. Uh -huh, but uh, if once the market keep moving up, they go back to the stock market. So it's a just different style and different uh, pattern of uh, investing. F uh, but what we has been doing is uh, uh, we keep educating that uh -huh, uh, the you have like a lot of order tied like stop loss or doing some things. Uh -huh. That one is the most important to educate them that they have to have the discipline into uh, for investing. 